Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our IDS series on inclusive trade. The fifth United Nations Conference on Least Developed Countries is ongoing in Qatar. And from all the messaging and very interesting discussions going on, it is clear that there is need and call for bold action along with development cooperation to really achieve meaningful progress towards sustainable development in least developed countries. An important pathway to achieve this is inclusive trade. So how do we better support and integrate least developed countries in international trade? While there are certainly very useful existing trading arrangements, it is also evident that LDC participation has remained largely stagnant. Today's roundtable discusses this very question, enhancing the participation of LDCs in international trade towards informing the UN LDC-5 agenda. We will discuss enhancing participation of LDCs in global value chains through simple modifications to existing trade arrangements. Our discussion today will focus on the role of a new, well, existing but new uh, agenda, um, which has been termed very usefully as global value chains for LDCs, a scheme that can potentially play quite an important role in advancing inclusive trade for LDCs. We are joined by a very exciting panel today. We've got Lucien Cernit, Head of Global Regulatory Cooperation and International Procurement Negotiations, European Commission. We've also got Stephen Peringi, Director, Regional Integration and Trade Division, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, as well as Lena Gardimester, Deputy Director General, Department for International Trade, Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Finland. So to start, start us off, the new GVCs for LDCs scheme. For those of you who haven't joined us earlier in our very first inclusive trade seminar, you know, are in luck because we've got Lucin with us again. And let me now ask Lucin to kind of jog our memory back, but also tell us more about this new evidence that has come up. So Lucin, why don't you tell us about the GVCs for LDCs agenda and why this should be an important action going forward? Many thanks, Amrita. Hello, colleagues. Hello, everyone. I'm very delighted to be here um, again in, in the very informative series run by the Institute of Development Studies and with uh, a very clear path that you have already uh, explained, Amrita. My task now is uh, slightly easier, so I'll, I'd like to uh, perhaps only mm, move ahead by presenting a few elements that uh, will allow us to, to have a meaningful discussion on what um, can we do more to integrate uh, these developed countries and uh, also in line with, with your um, agenda on inclusive trade. Um, in this particular example that uh, I want to illustrate today, also small farmers. So it's not just about the poorest countries in the world, but it's also about small producers and small farmers in the poorest countries in the world who are um, perhaps somewhat uh, surprisingly already pretty well integrated in some niche products but there can be more that we can do to facilitate the development potential of uh, such supply chains so today um, i wanted to illustrate this um, uh, broader idea this broader proposal dubbed GVCs for LDCs with a very uh, specific case study on um, exports from LDCs of organic products, um, an area where they're very well placed, as we shall see in a minute, and I think where we can tick many boxes in terms of sustainable trade and inclusive trade for um, uh, the kind of, uh, I think, uh, stakeholders that we want to encourage to benefit from international trade. So. This is work that I carried out with uh, my colleague, Adria Berga Augusti. And I'd like to uh, mention also explicitly that uh, these 
uh, views that I will express today are our personal views as the authors and they do not necessarily represent the views of the European Commission. Um, so uh, let me now perhaps just move very quickly to um, I will I will skip in the interest of time most of the rationale for the um, proposal, the, the dire need to ensure that um, least developed countries have a, a greater participation in international trade, simply because you have ex explored already very well the issue. We are in the uh, in the middle of the UN LDC summit, so I'm sure that uh, the understanding of the need for trade and that development is uh, the case is very well made so i don't want to belabor the point too much but just to say that uh, here for instance if you look at the assessment from a major development uh, organizations of the current situation for LDCs, uh, one could immediately see that um, there is a very acute a very important need for uh, us to perhaps put forward new ideas that could help us because they are in a dire situation and they are probably you know, a very in one of the worst crises in recent years because of the combination of multiple things that have happened so far, and also because um, so we we we've been trying to help uh, least developed countries over time with a number of um, trade rules, with many trade arrangements that were particularly designed to help LDCs to uh, integrate uh, in global supply chains to participate in world trade. Here I, I list um, some of these elements and the existing schemes that have been in existence and they work relatively well. It's not that um, um, they haven't produced benefits, they did produce benefits. Uh, and there, there's ample evidence that schemes like uh, everything but arms that the European Union has been offering to LDCs with unrestricted full-fledged, duty-free, quota-free on all products have made uh, an important difference for LDCs. So there is there is perhaps also this um, paradox that in a sense we have offered LDCs, at least on the face of them and in the traditional sense, the most generous trade uh, arrangements. And yet, um, as you said, Amrit, that their share in uh, world trade has been stagnant for decades we are still uh, very uh, far behind the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goal uh, objective of um, promoting the integration of LDCs in world trade towards a target of 2% of world trade. We're still not there in 2% of world exports. LDCs are halfway through and they have been there for, for quite some years. And so there is this paradox of them not being able to integrate successfully, us using all our tools in the trade policy. So it, it may be, um, people say, well, what's left? Is it really something that we can do more using trade or has trade run its course for LDCs when it comes to development? Well, the good news is that there can still be things we can offer to LDCs, simply because for the time being, the existing tools have, I would say, concentrated on direct trade. The kind of traditional trade flows that used to happen decades ago where products did not cross from one country to another along different stages of production before reaching the final consumer. But if we were to take that logic, this is the logic of global businesses. So if you were to apply this logic to um, trade policy, there is scope for us to further liberalize the LDC products that are imported in a particular country, they are then incorporated in a, in a more sophisticated product to use, as I tried over time since I launched this idea to use mangoes as an example. That's why I even call this, this mango, the mango theory. It's one thing to export raw mangoes. Uh, so for that kind of exports from LDCs, we already gave them everything we could. But what happens if raw mangoes, fresh mangoes are incorporated in a, in a beverage or in an agri-food in, in some food products. And they are exported not from an LDC, but say from the United States or from Brazil or from other countries to the EU or vice versa, from the EU to the United States or to Brazil. There, the LDC mango is trapped in the wrong product, which keeps paying duties, often double-digit duties around the world. So this is the untapped potential of 
allowing LDC products to be further integrated in, in global supply chains by giving an incentive to producers to source the existing um, very uh, competitive products that LDC produce also for their global operations. And in doing so, these uh, uh, intermediaries and these producers, these sometimes multinational companies or even uh, food processors, for instance, in our case for organic products, they will also have an incentive because they will get a tariff reduction, a pro rata tariff reduction, which is proportionate to the value of LDC content that they would introduce in their processed food. So essentially here we're talking about a triple benefit for LDCs. Um, we would uh, offer products that incorporate LDC ingredients, a tariff preference, which currently doesn't necessarily happen. So as I said, on many food products, if you trade between two countries that do not have an FTA, if you introduce LDC ingredients uh, in those products, they still pay the full tariff. Here, they would get an incentive and an advantage from a tariff reduction. The second exam the second benefit from, for LDCs is that given the dynamics in the market for such uh, future uh, processes, you have a relatively small uh, uh, batch of producers. LDCs are, after all, small in, in the world market. And you will have the world competing to get a share of that pie. So everyone will compete for LDC ingredients because that gives them tariff preferences. So in, you increase the demand for the products that LDCs produce already, and that will give a higher price premium to existing producers in LDCs. They don't have to produce necessarily more to benefit, they would, they may be able to increase their terms of trade as we call them, this price premium, which indeed would immediately uh, allow them without necessarily boosting their the, uh, production. Sometimes they have production constraints, but based on the existing production, they can get a, a bigger development dividend from trade. And last but not least, perhaps in the medium term, if not immediately, the same, uh, processors that would buy these LDC inputs, the, the fresh products, the pineapples and the mangoes and the cashew nuts and all these ingredients, the vanillas, all the things that I'm going to show you in a minute, they would have probably over a long term an interest to invest more in LDCs because the closer you are to your sources of the future tariff preferences, the closer you are to these uh, 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 suppliers. Remember, these are limited suppliers. So you are competing with many other companies for these LDC ingredients. If you are investing in LDCs, you will be closer to these suppliers. You can probably uh, upscale the domestic production. You can move the ladder to produce a few more sophisticated, more value-added products in the LDCs themselves. So you would have an FDI attraction effect from a trade initiative. Of course, it's not going to happen over time, and it may not happen everywhere. You would need to have some supportive policies, but they, the potential is there. So just to illustrate where we are today and where we want to go, I have created here a very practical, a very simple schematic example of the additional benefits that we can offer LDC. So the GVCs of today in the um, orange kind of uh, color, you have LDC direct exports, say coffee beans. They go to the first country of destination and there they either stay local or they may be for the process, they may be put in some Nespresso capsules, and then they will sell all over the world. Now, these Nespresso capsules, which contain coffee from LDCs, they will face duties, unless there are arrangements, which in any event, they do not take care and they do not pay attention to LDC content. These tariffs are MFN or FTA. They, they are not taking into account the need to integrate LDC. So LDC coffee beans, the moment they are further processed and re-exported, they will face full duties. The initiative says, look, if you import coffee beans from Ethiopia, you process that into in Switzerland and you make the George Clooney famous capsule and now you want to sell it all over the world. Why don't you reduce the tariff faced by this processed product, this Nespresso capsules, proportionate to the value of the coffee that you sourced in Ethiopia? And in doing so, you derive all these benefits that I described earlier. So this is where we left the proposal uh, when last time I presented this to Amrita and her colleagues uh, a couple of years ago. I think there was a very lot, a lot of interest in the proposal. It was somewhat theoretical, and although 
people say, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, it, it remains somewhat as a potential for the future. Now, the good news is that we at the European Commission have um, a unique data set, which allows us to illustrate the potential of this initiative with real data, with uh, data from 1 million transactions of EU imports of organic products. And you will see why this is an interesting sort of, not just an, an interesting angle for analysis, but perhaps also the, the, a very promising starting point for a real initiative, for a pilot study, uh, because it allows us to use existing digital tools for traceability and other elements that are ex extremely important to operationalize these kind of proposals in practice. So one word about the, the platform, it's called Traces. So Traces is the digital platform that we use in the EU to trade in organic products. Um, it is used by 90 countries, by 90 trading partners. So it, essentially it's a global digital platform. Everyone who wants to sell organic products to the EU will have to be registered in Traces. It's a very user-friendly, very simple platform, which allows, uh, as I said, and as you will see in a minute, even small farmers from um, remote places in, in LDCs to essentially connect to the platform and be able to sell the products, perhaps through uh, uh, intermediaries and other uh, players in the supply chain. So we have 1 million firm level data of organic trade, including from LDCs for uh, several years from 2017. And here we see a number of crucial elements to assess the GVC for LDC proposal because we see the producers, the names of the producers, the country from exportation, but also the country through which products travel to Europe. So these traceability requirements that are part of the EU legislation and that they are very effectively implemented in these digital tools will allow us to trace products if the coffee beans move from Ethiopia to Mexico before going to the EU. That will be seen in the data. And this is on the basis of this firm level traceability records that we have in traces that I managed to produce a few uh, key findings, which I hope you'll find it uh, interesting as well. So this is very schematically how things work. You are a producer, you have to get your product accredited by an independent lab. They will test your product to guarantee that this is an organic product. You have your certificate. It has to have all these traceability requirements. It crosses the border, the custom official looks at it. And if you tick all the boxes, it is then released in the EU, in all our supermarkets with this famous logo of organic certification. It's a pan-European quality certificate that gives products and producers a premium market, basically. And this is a very dynamic market. It's a growing market. European consumers, they are very interested and they are prepared to pay a price for organic products. So it's, it's a lot of potential in the future. Now, as I said, the GVC for LDC try to uh, facilitate and we're looking at this indirect export from LDCs. So of course, you will see in the traces database in the green, the kind of the direct exports that the traditional trade policy in Europe has already generously offered all the benefits that LDCs can have. There are no quotas, there are no tariffs. Of course, for organic products, you have the certification requirement, but that's valid for everyone. And what is in the orange or reddish kind of uh, colors is the other ways in which LDC products travel around the world. They can be imported in the EU, but once you export them along the value chains, again, this is something we could perhaps further explore and give tariff preferences to LDCs content in EU exports now. But also we import products from plenty of other countries which they contain significant amounts of LDC ingredients. And these products, when they come to Europe, they do not necessarily enter, like in the green channel, duty-free, quota-free. So again, a, a lot of untapped potential for LDC exporters who would like to be better integrated in the supply chain. So if we look at the data, what do we see? Well, the first key finding, it was really a, an astonishing surprise. I even asked my, my co-author who is a full-time custom official in Spain. He's doing this for a living. And I said, Adria, this, are we sure we haven't made a mistake here? How can it be so big? But it is. Uh, the, the data we have shows that LDCs account for 10% of all our organic exports, imports. Sorry. So if you compare this with the, the first chart I've shown you, where LDCs remain at a very depressing, stagnant 1% of world exports, when it comes to exports of organic products to the EU, 
they're doing extremely well. They are moving um, steadily towards around 10% uh, market share in the last year we have data available for. So they, they made steady progress and they are competitive. So this is the, the green uh, channel, I would say, where, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that we offer them um, generous duty-free, quota-free, plus this digital easy certification that even small farmers can comply with, I say easy, I mean, certification in Europe it can hardly be called easy. I think it's quite stringent. But the fact that they can comply with, there are some perhaps some fixed costs, but once you're in it, once you comply with these rules, it pays off. So this is the first message that there are a lot of uh, economic potential in, in, in this uh, niche market of organic products. So here you can see, if you, if you wanted another way to look at their competitiveness, you can see that uh, Togo, exports more organic products by weight to the EU than the United Kingdom. Uh, you can see that Madagascar sends and manages to sell in value terms this time more organic products to the EU than the United States. So they are really in the top league. It's exactly where you would like in an ideal world LDCs to belong in order for trade to deliver their development benefits. So they can compete against the biggest and the most competitive players in organic products. And of course, they have a fairly concentrated uh, structure. Many of these LDCs, they concentrate on uh, very few, but very successful lucrative uh, uh, commodities. But you see that there are many LDCs that are already in the system. I think the important thing for any of them is that they are capable of being already integrated. The fixed cost of being part of such uh, organic products has been already uh, taken on board, so they are ready to move to the next level. Um, and again, because we were started the event with this inclusive trade, also the second and quite astonishing finding that we, we realized when we looked at this very detailed, firm level, company by company transactions that we have on organic product, we see that small producers account for 82% of the transactions. Of course, they, they are not um, all into big value kind of transactions. But the fact that we have so many companies, so many small farmers in the poorest countries in the world who can export to the most demanding market of organic products, so the, with the highest quality standards, and using a, a, a user-friendly, but nonetheless a sophisticated traceability online tool for trade, these are extremely good news. It means we can rely on such schemes to facilitate their further integration. And the final and I think the most important element for the proposal for the next level of integrating GVCs to LCs is that, as I announced at the very beginning, these products, they can be exported directly to Europe, but they are also exported via many other countries. So all in all, if we count also the, ex the e exports of European uh, countries, we import LCs not just to consume them at home, and we will also export organic products around the world. So we have 27 member states that part of what we import directly, we will re-export, but paying tariffs. And part of what we import indirectly from 20 other partners around the world, these are LDC ingredients in products which will probably still pay duties. I was extremely curious, for instance, because Mexico is one of the, the most successful platforms, uh, somewhat surprisingly perhaps, but Mexico, has a very high intensity of exporting products to Europe with LDC ingredients. And I thought, well, but Mexico has an FTA with the EU, so maybe there isn't much we can do. But if you take the magnifying glass and if you look at every single product where LDC ingredients can be still in, be incorporated, you see that even in FTAs, you have examples and exceptions where products still pay duties. I wouldn't give you the exact example, but there is a product from Mexico to Europe that still has double digit product, double digit tariffs, despite the existence of an FTA, or there may be a quota, or maybe there are rules of origin, which then the Mexican producer cannot uh, fulfill it's because of the LDC ingredients, and they will not get the duty free. So the fact that there is an FTA in place between one country or another does not necessarily mean that the development potential for LDCs has been exhausted. So again, looking at the key products for LDCs, here you see that they play, as I said, they, they play a very major role and multinational companies, food processors and other downstream producers, they can rely on LDCs as 
very uh, strong players, very competitive players with both the quantity and the quality to provide cocoa beans, vanilla, coffee, soybeans, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to mango and gum, uh, Arabic gum. So there is a, a, a significant variety of products in this very microcosm, I would say, of organic products where still LDCs can benefit more. Now, to conclude, if you were to say, look, we may start with organic products, we have the digital tool that will allow us traceability. So there is no infrastructure cost for, say, if Brazil wants to import, um, you know, on a, a product from the EU that incorporates LDC ingredients. We have this tool, it's there. Brazilians, both the authorities and the Brazilian explorer are familiar with it because they use it themselves to trade with us. You see all the evidence of this traceability of LDC ingredients in the tool. There is no need to prove origin or traceability because this cost has been already incurred. We did it for organic certification purposes. Now it can be reused as a trade facilitation tool for LDCs. But imagine you would scale this up to all the products that LDC export. Then the potential is much bigger. You would get within our calculations that I did with another colleague a, a couple of years ago, you will get very close to the 2% SDG target over time that we all wanted to achieve. Even more importantly, LDCs will export via other developing countries. So another important uh, objective of promoting South-South regional trade would also be boosted by such a scheme. It's not just LDCs exporting to Europe who will then export to India or Brazil. LDCs will export a lot through, and you could see it also from the previous chart, through other regional players, South Africa, or even among themselves. So South-South trade will increase. There is no uh, competition. It's a win-win situation. By promoting LDC trade, effectively, you increase exports of other developing countries. And that eventually will allow um, a greater participation uh, of LDCs along supply chains, precisely as the WTO Director General recently mentioned in one of her speeches. So I hope that um, this uh, provides sufficient uh, sort of, uh, it will intrigue people uh, sufficiently enough for this idea to be taken forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luis. And it was really uh, great to you know, revise, revive the initiative and also see some of the new insights about uh, organic products. And I think uh, linking it further, looking at different um, development outcomes, I think beyond businesses and firms in the future, potentially using household level data maybe uh, may make this even more compelling. But for now, I would like to um, I have some questions for the for the others for the other members of our panel today, um, and you know, putting that sort of um, picture that uh, you know Lucian has has presented for us in perspective, along with the UN LDC five agenda that is um, you know being discussed, we see, of course, there is a critical role for economic diversification, for structural transformation. And a risk, of course, of over reliance on primary commodities. But we also know that there have been barriers, uh, there have been, um, you know, struggles and challenges in um, LDCs to move to value added trade. Now, with that, and you know, with those set of challenges and ambitions for structural transformation, Stephen, what do you think? sort of are the key barriers, really the key barriers for LDC participation in global value chains. And what do you see is the role for an initiative such as the GVC for LDCs, you know, which identifies what is happening at the moment, but supports diversification uh, along the value chain and also, you know, building cap cap capabilities towards the future. So sorry for mm. the long question, but I hope that's... <laughs> No, uh, that kind of puts that in in uh, sets the scene. No, th no, no. Thank you very much, uh, Amrita, and thanks, Lucian, for the uh, clear clear presentation. Um, interestingly, I think the the discussion on um, LDCs and their share on the global trade. Um, I think this 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 conversation has been there for a long time since even uh, in the lead up to the duty-free quota-free market access, and even the, the 
a desire to see uh, those emerging economies with, um, with the ability to do so to give you the free uh, quota, quota free market access. And they continue to do so. If I'm not wrong, I think just last week, one of the emerging economies actually uh, it, it offered 98% of tariffs uh, as duty free, quota free country uh, market access for a few. Uh, LDCs within the within the within this continent, at least uh, in uh, in Africa. So we know um, what the issues have been, and I think that's what you're asking. One of the key issues has been the productive capacity, and this uh, productive capacity being um, both in terms of um, technology, capabilities, skills. Um, so we have ended with a situation whereby uh, many LDCs. Uh, continue to export um, non-value-added um, uh, commodities because of those because of those because of those barriers. And some of these things have have actually been um, uh, amplified by the by the huge demands for issues on standards. But it is interesting to see the results that um, the, the the analysis that Lucian has given here on organics because there is a standards dimension, of course, on uh, organics. And we see such a huge share of um, LDCs being able to access the, 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 the European market. But, be they, uh, but even after saying that, one of the key challenges has actually been the standards, the ability of the LDCs to meet the, the standards required in the destination, in the destination markets. There is, of course, the big issue um, of the broader question of the, of, the, of, the, of the rules of origin. I think the, the, sometimes the inability to accumulate rules of origin to take advantage of um, some of this um, market access that is, that is, that is, that is, uh, that is offered. And the question of um, trade facilitation, uh, high costs uh, of um, lack of competitiveness because of the challenges that come with trade facilitation uh, when these LDCs want to, to, to send uh, their exports, especially those value added exports uh, to, the, to, to, the, to the rest of the world. And we know most of, we know most of this. Um, and that's, that's why um, when you look at the trend of the share of um, LDCs, and I'm thinking here in my mind about the African LDCs in particular, because they are the majority, you look at the share where they were 10 years ago uh, when we had the Eastern Book Program of Action and where they are now as we start the uh, Doha Program of Action, you always get frustrated or even when you do an analysis or um, a monitoring of the SDG 17, you always get frustrated because this, shares, uh, this uh, share is not, uh, is, not, is not growing. And that's why I found this, uh, um, this work uh, on the uh, GVCs for LDCs uh, quite interesting. I did say uh, that uh, I saw the, the technical piece uh, when it came out about two, three years ago. And I think it was quite convincing that um, if one has um, a good, um, because I think at that point, the key question was, how do you trace the, the product that comes from the, an LDC country all the way to the end, uh, you know, under the whole idea of the trading value added and be able to say at this stage, um, this good can actually enter because there is an embodied continent, content that came from the an LDC, an LDC uh, country. So I find this initiative quite innovative. I don't see what um, uh, what it is that um, would um, make it impractical, and I also don't see why uh, it is not as convincing as it is technically. Because now we have a clear example on this um, on this uh, on this on this organic. So I find it quite um, uh, quite 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 in innovative and. Even as I was, I was uh, going through this, I was even say, thinking that um, it also even gives us an opportunity to prepare for an even bigger challenge that the LDCs are going to face as we move into the, into the, into the era of climate action, because we are going to have now uh, barriers to trade that are going to look at the carbon content. And um, some of this carbon content would be because of the lack of technology in these LDCs. So they are going to be penalized for not taking the care or care of um, uh, the carbon content in what, in what, they, uh, what they export. So this GPC for LDCs, first of all, would help us um, demonstrate that it is possible to raise that share 
to attract investments because investor would be, investors would see the potential to grow their markets if they're producing from, a, uh, from an African, um, uh, from, from an LDC. And that is also going to give an opportunity for the renewing of the, of the, of the technology that would be required even as we go to, to this world where we have to start um, the process of, uh, of uh, decarbonization. So looking at it from that broad context, um, I see um, it as something that we need. Okay, maybe we can start the way you have started by looking at a few tariff lines uh, that one can be able to trace and be able to, to show. Um, I think I would push back on the idea that this would, um, would entrench um, commodity, 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 commodity exports, because um, if you if you open, if you take the idea that um, uh, trade intermediates can also occur among the LDCs, and if I talk about the region where I'm placed, where we have um, a big platform under the African continent of free trade area that is going to make it possible for, um, for LDCs within the continent to trade with each other, uh, something like this would uh, give a two-track um, or two pathways for LDCs to grow their market within Africa in intra-African trade, but at the same time, a pathway for them to grow their 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 their, their exports to the rest to the rest to the rest of the world. So this is what I would say as a, as an initial uh, entry point. Um, I am convinced technically um, with the with the arguments, uh, with the use of the data and statistics to show that it's doable. And I think the issue was how do you avoid leakage or misuse of um, such an initiative? Um, and I think this traceability uh, demonstrates that actually it can be done. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Um, it's really interesting to hear that, you know, there is sort of both belief and, and uh, actual practical possibility to take this forward. I would now have a question for Lena. Um, you know, both Lucian and Stephen mentioned uh, the importance of support, complementary support, other kind of measures that would be really critical in making sure that, you know, this kind of um, a scheme or even the LDC5 um, agenda uh, for supporting um, economic diversification goes forward. What types of support, and you know, this, of course, there's a huge debate about aid for trade, um, and there's also some concern about disconnect uh, in how aid for trade might have, um, you know, with local realities. You know, Lucien gave us very compelling evidence about how it, there are benefits for smallholder farmers. Um, but what type of support do you think is critical for expanding LDC participation in global value chains? And do you see, um, an initiative like the GVC for LDC's agenda, um, kind of, you know, aligning with other types of support which um, uh, LDCs would need to sort of further build value added trade. Lena, over to you. Thank you. Yes, th thank you, Amrita. And thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this very important discussion. Thank you, Lucian, also for your interesting introduction uh, on the GVCs for LDCs and uh, Stephen for your views, uh, uh, much of which I actually share very much. And you can see uh, my points are to similar lines, uh, what you said. But uh, on the GVC for LDCs proposal, uh, we definitely see the value of it. Uh, we can see that this uh, initiative can play a very important role in gener generating interest towards the LDC exporters, lowering costs and uh, opening a clearer plat path to EU and other markets. And therefore, I, I do think that it will add an important element to support in uh, expanding the LDC value added trade. However, uh, and as you, you uh, Amrita, uh, posed the question, we must keep a firm uh, focus on removing the existing challenges that LDCs face in the international trade. 
and this is the critical part in uh, expanding the LDC participation in global value chains. The production and export of primary goods is very important, but we should also aim to increase the productive, as mentioned uh, uh, before me, uh, mentioned the uh, productive capacity of uh, LDCs uh, to benefit more of the value added supply chains. And uh, we need to continue to strengthen the LDCs uh, capacity capacity to participate and benefit fully from the international trade. And uh, in terms of support, I heard what you, uh, was mentioned about the Edward Trade uh, support, but we still think that it remains very relevant in creating a uh, conducive business environment, strengthening product productive capacity, innovation, and building economic infrastructure, i.e. aiming to strengthen and diversify the economic uh, base of uh, LDCs. But yes, you're right, we need to seek uh, ways to enhance the Edward Trade support. For example, uh, we would need to catalyze more concrete business partnerships and this is exactly what we are concentrating now on and focusing in Finland, how to create more concrete business to business partnerships. And uh, we have seen some uh, positive, those small but still positive uh, uh, examples, how this can really uh, catalyze the business and uh, value uh, participating in value chains. Uh, regarding the um, GV GVCs for LDCs initiative and uh, the targeted support, uh, like in terms of targeted support for uh, it for trade, it could be also play an inf important role. Support to strengthen, uh, for example, the uh, organic agricultural value chains uh, could demonstrate uh, that success is possible and then it could uh, create a positive uh, case for others to follow. Uh, I would also like to touch upon the uh, uh, sustainable parts of the uh, trade and also inclusive trade. So we should uh, always uh, aim to extend benefits to uh, benefits of trade to women, youths and other vulnerable groups, including persons with disabilities. And it is equally important that the uh, trade is environmentally sustainable and contributes to towards fighting uh, climate change and preserving biodiversity. Uh, Stephen mentioned something uh, about the challenges uh, that this, these requirements bring, and uh, we definitely agree. And uh, here comes again the support that we must create uh, uh, to uh, at the LDCs. Uh, consumers are increasingly demanding sustainable products and there are also new re uh, re re regulatory requirements coming up. There is an increasing tendency to make sure that the whole, val whole of the value chain is sustainable and these trends will have an impact on suppliers in LDCs and therefore we just need for the trade to be increasingly targeted also to support sustainability issues. So uh, th there is uh, a scenario that's, uh, that, that uh, these requirements could actually uh, induce a positive case where we create a virtuous uh, circle uh, a positive spiral leading to improved human rights and less negative environmental impacts. 
the EU companies uh, would work closely with the partners in LDCs to address the bottlenecks and improve sustainability of the value chain. And sustainable production would become a competitive advantage. And this is actually what we also are aiming here in Finland in our business, that uh, it, it must be the competitive advantage uh, that is the sustainable production. But uh, sustainability is the global mega trend and we can't cannot get around on the sustainability requirements. So this is what we need to uh, notably focus on uh, in the future. But lastly, I would like to leave you with some information. Uh, in Finland, we have uh, commissioned two studies um, on um, how the proposed EU corporate sustainability due diligence legislation will impact uh, the developing countries, their trade and business. And these studies will be launched at the end of this month on the 27th of March, and we will open re registration soon. So just to leave you with this information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lena. We look forward to, to joining that. I'm sure it will be an interesting um, event. I think, um, you know, based on those two excellent contributions, Lucen, there's a big ask for you. And I'll add one of the areas of questions that have come from the audience. I think the first ask is that while there is potential and promise here for an initiative like GVCs for LDCs, how do we uh, sort of demonstrate and show links with other types of development outcomes. You know, one of the key questions asked is about food security. Lena asked about gender outcomes, sustainability. I know, you know, not everything can be done with, there's no one solution for all. This is a good start, but how can we maybe start to show some of the links and, you know, how this can be an important starting point for some of those areas. And the second question, which is probably something you've thought about already, is that what are the challenges for such an implementation to, you know, such a scheme to be implemented in practice? How do we you know, go forward with piloting and then actual implementation of that? So I'll pass over to you, Lucien, for I think sort of these two difficult questions to be responded to. Yes, well, uh, I was trying to type at some point some uh, quick answers to uh, our very active audience who seems to have a, a keen interest in uh, coming to grips with this proposal, understand the, the, the mechanics of it. Um, maybe it's easy to start with a food security question, which is a very legitimate question. And I think uh, it's important to get things right uh, when it comes to such crucial aspects. I, as far as I can uh, say at least in, in this uh, microcosm of unique uh, uh, granular data of organic products. If you look at the export uh, uh, structure of uh, LDCs in, in organics, you see that they um, really have these uh, cash crops. They, they really try to create um, foreign earnings based on a handful of uh, products, which may not be in of themselves sufficient for food security for these countries. Many LDCs are net food importers. So you cannot just eat vanilla every day, every three times a day, uh, you know, you cannot have all your uh, a balanced meal on the basis of one or the two products where currently LDCs are very good at uh, generating export earnings in selling organic. So there is no way in which you could say, no, by exporting too much, we are going to take away the food from uh, the people in those countries because they don't eat that anyway. It's, it's a, a choice between exporting them for a premium price or letting them rot on the field. So that's what the, the, the proposal will, would try to do to maximize the uh, foreign earnings for smallholders, for direct, direct earnings for farmers the kind of cash crops with which then they can buy um, food that they need to buy anyway. We've seen the, the major crisis uh, that tri was triggered by the Ukraine war where many of the seas were relying on uh, some of the staple food imports that they under no circumstances can produce, can be produced at home. 
even climatic or other types of uh, constraints. So they have to be imported anyway. In order to import them, you need the money. So this proposal will allow trade to be this development driven, um, engage uh, with the rest of the world for your own food security. So I think instead of um, jeopardizing food security, creating the necessary foreign earnings will allow LDCs to cushion the potential shocks on their food security from commodity crisis or geopolitical tensions or any other uh, unforeseen circumstances. So in, in that sense, it's an enhancing element for food security. Um, the second question you asked, uh, Amrita, about the practicability, I think this is what really triggered a very keen interest from my side and the colleague with, with whom I discussed this here. The fact that we have the trade infrastructure, a very sophisticated, very reliable trade infrastructure with digital certification of the origin of every single, take, take the label of a, of a yogurt and look at all the ingredients. If it's an organic yogurt, the European legislation requires traceability of every single ingredient, even if it's a tiny proportion of that yogurt to the actual origin. Now, if we were to take that evidentiary piece, the kind of documentation that we in Europe collect for the purpose of our own organic legislation for the safety and for the, the, the kind of the trust of our consumers, what prevents say, a, a third country custom official to rely on the same evidentiary base that we in Europe have already put in this digital system called TRACES, which 90 countries around the world are already connected to. It's not as if you have never heard of traces. It's not as if you would say, yeah, but how do I know that these uh, documents are correct? They are already there. They are developed with the highest uh, level of trade facilitation parameters. So it's a matter of, I think, political will and engagement and, and dialogue to create this um, interest in saying, look, we may reuse these documents for the benefit of LDCs. They've taken the fixed cost of complying with all these trade facilitation, organic certification. Why shouldn't we reuse these documents when we export the yogurt with the mangoes from, from Madagascar? Why, why these documents uh, can only stay in Europe? If they are available there, if we can have the arrangement with multiple jurisdictions to create a platform for uh, LDCs to be uh, given those preferences, I think it's, it's a very, very promising uh, starting point, precisely because we have the necessary tools to maybe run a pilot. Perfect. Um, I think we've got a little bit of time. So what I want to do now is to ask each of our fellow panelists for one final action point, which we want to send to the UN LDC5 agenda, starting with Lena. Tina, do you have a final point to highlight for the UNLDC5 agenda? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, I will, my final point will be the first point which I um, raised uh, in my comments and uh, that, that would be that uh, we must uh, be really firm and keep the focus on uh, removing the many challenges uh, and use uh, ed for trade for this in a, across the field in an innovative way and uh, referring the, to the expanding regulation that it is coming, we can't get around that. So we must keep this uh, focus on removing the challenges for LDCs. And this is uh, from the uh, EU and Finnish perspective, and uh, this is uh, what we need to focus on in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Over to Stephen. So, mine is to say that we know, we know what um, makes it difficult for LDCs to raise their shares. And I think we need um, at this moment to sort of um, take the risk, if we may call it that way, to try something new. Um, and what um, we have before us here is something new. Uh, those uh, trade, uh, trade uh, practitioners know that um, the survival of exporting farms 
from developing countries, especially LDCs, is um, very low compared to other exporting farms from elsewhere. I think a tool or an instrument like this is giving us that opportunity to not only uh, diversify the products, but also the potential to expand the markets. So, so I, I think uh, to the LDC five, I think let's let's uh, let's uh, try something new. Let's take the risk. Uh, in any case, what amount of trade are we talking about? Uh, if we are moving only from two percent to want to go to four percent, and this is something that is uh, going to help us to to, to try that. That's what. I, let's just take the risk if people see it as a risk. Thank you, Stephen. I think we're underlining that it's the time for that bold action that's on the agenda. Closing remark from Lucin, um, GVC for LDCs. What's the one message you'd like to send to LDC5? Well, I, I would simply say that um, uh, to, to continue on, on Stephen's uh, uh, idea, taking the risk is even um, I think um, uh, a very small price to pay in a sense because Europe is not known for a risk-taking jurisdiction. In fact, I think we are some of, one of the most risk-averse jurisdictions when it comes to standards and procedures. We have the famous precautionary principle. So you can take the risk, the risk while trusting us. If we have taken the risk and if we have had in operation a system that allowed for products from LDCs to be safely certified, to uh, let us all consumers enjoy that. Let's take the same calculated risk, and I think it's a risk is the wrong word here. It's, a, it's not really a risk, it's just the fact that we haven't probably explored it in the past. It's something new, but uh, it's true. It, there is a bit of apprehension when it comes to, to new things, but um, the good news is that it's a small experiment. LDCs are remain unfortunately a small player we're talking about a handful of products to begin with and we're talking about one of the best uh, trade facilitation traceability tools in the world so if here we cannot be adventurous i wonder where great i think we've we've managed to end with a very clear action plan and that is Let's be bold, let's take action, but let's keep sight of the existing challenges in a clear and systematic and informed way. So thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope to continue this conversation. Thank you, Lucien, thanks Stephen, and thanks Lena, and to our audience online as well as on YouTube. We hope to see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.